Hi, I'm Mikhail Sekaris, and it is a pleasure to talk to you today about my book, Drugs and the FDA, Safety, Efficacy, and the Public's Trust. I'm chief of the Division of Hematology at the Sylvester Cancer Center at University of Miami. I was inspired to write the book, Drugs and the FDA, based on my experience as a member of the Oncologic Drugs Advisory Committee of the FDA. I served on this committee for five years and actually chaired the committee for two years. Ours was the committee that made recommendations to the FDA on whether or not to approve cancer drugs in the United States based on our assessment of the balance of safety and efficacy of those drugs. I was particularly inspired to write the book Drugs and the FDA when I served at the controversial Avastin hearings back in 2011. During these hearings, the FDA wanted to withdraw the approval of Avastin for the treatment of advanced breast cancer, while its manufacturer, Genentech, wanted to continue to market the drug. We played the role of jury in what was essentially a high-stakes court trial. We voted publicly to decide with either the FDA or with Genentech, and the hearings played out like a movie court scene to the very end as we were whisked away out of the FDA building under armed security. The FDA had approved Avastin for the treatment of advanced breast cancer quickly using a regulatory mechanism known as accelerated approval. Accelerated approval was born out of HIV AIDS activism in the 1980s and 90s to get drugs to desperate patient populations with few treatment options quickly. Drugs like Avastin that received accelerated approval do so based on data from early clinical trials of the drug. Unfortunately, Subsequent trials that were supposed to confirm the exciting results from those early trials actually fell flat. At a core level, the Avastin trial put to the test the FDA's authority to withdraw drugs from the market and the trust the public has in the FDA to safeguard its health. Increasing the FDA's authority to withdraw drugs from the market is actually a key component of a bill making its way through Congress this year. Part of the exciting aspect of writing this book was doing research on the history of the FDA. And I'd love to read you a quote from a doctor um, from 1937. This was a Dr. Calhoun from Tulsa, Oklahoma. And he writes, nobody but Almighty God and I can know what I have been through these past few days. I have been familiar with death in the years since I received my medical degree from Tulane University School of Medicine with the rest of my class of 1911. Covington County, Oklahoma has been my home. I have practiced here for years. Any doctor who has practiced more than a quarter of a century has seen his share of death. But to realize that six human beings, all of them my patients, one of them my best friend, are dead because they took medicine that I prescribed for them innocently. And to realize that this medicine, which I had used for years in such cases, suddenly had become a deadly poison in its newest and most modern form, as recommended by a great and reputable pharmaceutical firm in Tennessee. Well, that realization has given me such days and nights of mental and spiritual agony as I did not believe a human being could undergo and survive. I have known hours when death for me would be a welcome relief. Powerful words from a doctor in the 1930s. And what led him to write those words was a tragedy. And it's tragedies like this that have led to the creation of the FDA. In 1902, for example, one tragic event in which 22 children in St. Louis and in Camden, New Jersey, sick with smallpox and diphtheria died when they were given vaccines to treat these infections. The vaccines though were contaminated with another deadly toxin, tetanus. It was in response to this that Congress passed the Biologics Control Act and soon after the Pure Food and Drugs Act. But these new laws were limited in scope and drug safety was left up to the manufacturer until an another deadly event would lead to new legislation that really created the first step of the FDA. And that deadly event was when a manufacturing company referred to by Dr. Calhoun in Tennessee, the S.E. Massengill Company, sought to create a liquid form of an, of an antibiotic sulfonilamide that would be easier for patients, particularly children, to ingest. 
the company's chief chemist, Harold Cole Watkins, added substances to make the drug more palatable, including raspberry extract, saccharin, caramel, and the sweet-tasting solvent diethylene glycol, also known as antifreeze. It was in 1937 that 240 gallons of the medicine were distributed across the country, and doctors like Dr. Calhoun began to prescribing it regularly. But then 71 adults and 34 children died from taking the tainted antibiotic. A team of FDA inspectors were dispatched across the country to track down the company's 200 salesmen and identify the drugstores and doctor's offices that had stocked the elixir. Store by store, druggist by druggist, and prescription by prescription, the FDA team worked to find every patient who still had a bottle and confiscating the remaining medicine, recovering 234 of the 240 gallons distributed. It was this event that led to the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act of 1938, the very first time that drugs were required to be safe. It was another tragedy that led to drugs first having to be, demonstrate that they were effective, and that tragedy was prescription of the drugs thalidomide. Thalidomide was prescribed widely in Europe in the 1950s and early 1960s. It wasn't until a German physician, Wittekund Lenz, teamed up with the parent of a child who was born with birth defects, short arms, and they went around the countryside looking for other children who had similar birth defects to assess whether or not their mothers too had taken the drug thalidomide as a sedative. They eventually found 46 children born with limb deformities and almost all of their mothers had taken the drug. This led to the drug finally being stopped in its sales in Europe. And fortunately in the United States, the heroic efforts of a member of the FDA, Dr. Francis Oldham Kelsey, prevented the drug from ever reaching sales in the United States. It was this near miss of a nationwide tragedy that led to the legislation that eventually required that drugs be effective in addition to being safe that was passed in August of 1962. The purpose of the book Drugs and the FDA is to educate about the history of the FDA, what led to the way that it now thinks about drug approval, and to appreciate modern drug approval and the complicated aspects of assessing safety and efficacy that lead some drugs to be approved, some drugs to be denied, and some drugs that have been approved to actually be withdrawn from the market. I do hope that you enjoy the book Drugs and the FDA and appreciate your listening to me today. Thank you.